You ever think about what might happen if your small project were to be noticed by people and eventually transform into something cool, but in comparison, your previous thing isn't nearly as good, yet still remembered and visited by people for some reason? I'm talking about Portal. But before that, FX is legally obligated to play the following message. The following presentation contains major game or story elements that may change the experience of playing such a game for the first time. If you frown upon changes to the first time experience, you may want to consider viewing this presentation after playing the game in question. Viewer discretion is advised. Portal is an interesting game. Valve, founded in 1996, is the same company that runs Steam, one of the most popular and well-known PC game stores, which actually started as just a way to update their games before distributing games in 2005. Besides Steam, Valve has also released some of the most highly acclaimed games in the world, but they just can't count to three. Or can they? In 2005, a group of students at the DigiPen Institute of Technology published a puzzle platformer game called Narbacular Drop. This game is pretty bad. I suppose you'd better level your expectations for a game with Narbacular in its name. You play as Princess No Knees and cannot jump. As far as I can tell, the plot is that this princess has been trapped by a demon and has to use some kind of magical power to escape. This power is the ability to place two linked portals. It's not that fun. Again, this game isn't great, but the project caught the eye of Valve, and so the students were all employed by Valve to develop a game based on the concept of solving puzzles in a 3D environment with portals. They ultimately called it Portal. The main concept of Portal is to have the same portal mechanic as an Arbacular Drop, but to also be a good game. When you first begin the game, you start in this small glass box where you have a few seconds to get a bearing on the controls before anything happens. We can move around, listen to the radio, pick up these objects, drop them in the toilet, and get a look at the surroundings. The atmosphere is very artificial and sterile, with white panels on the floors, walls, and ceilings, and the 2000s futuristic style of white ellipsoids and aqua accents. Then, you hear the computerized voice. For your own safety, and the safety of others, please refrain from... Ignoring whatever that was, we begin the game by traveling through a portal. This is absolutely genius. This introduces the main premise right away, letting the player freely move in and out and get their bearings. We also get a brief look at the player character, who we won't know much about until later. It allows the player to see how the portals can change your orientation, which is something we'll need to get used to. We have to circle around the starting area to enter a different room, where we are immediately presented with a big red button. Whenever you see a big red button, what do you do? A. Press it. B. Read the manual. Or C. Walk back to the starting area. If you said C, I regret to inform you that you are wrong. The first instinct is to immediately step onto the button, which opens a door, as shown by the light trail connecting the two. Of course, once you step off the button to exit, the door closes. Fortunately, right next to the door is a giant cube, and so without any explanation, the player knows exactly what to do. Excellent. Great game design fundamentals make gameplay intuitive. The absolute simplicity of the environment and props make their use very obvious. Portal's light trails that connect buttons to devices are so simple, yet make understanding what's going on several times easier. Notice how the cube isn't already there when you enter the room. It falls from the chute after you understand the button, which tells you that this is an interactive object and provides a solution to the button problem. The whole game follows the same principle of intuitive design, and we'll see more of that later. We get another bit of dialogue from the unknown computer voice, and pass through an Aperture Particle Field Emancipation Grill, which is unimportant right now, but will eventually be an important puzzle element. Now that we know the basics of the gameplay, the game introduces portals once again. There are four rooms. We start in this central room with the stationary portal on the wall, and every few seconds, the linked portal switches to a different room. This is a great demonstration of how the portals work, but it could also be better. The time cycle makes the location of the portals more confusing, and means a lot of waiting for portals to appear in the right place. 
When this test chamber was brought to Portal 2, they changed the system so that the player presses buttons instead, which better illustrates the way portals work. Besides that, this is just a cube and button test with simple portals. Now that we're familiar with the gameplay, take a moment to inspect the environment, which has been largely the same throughout the game so far. Every test chamber is made of white panels on the walls, ceilings, and floors. Each chamber starts the same, exiting the elevator, viewing the summary display, and walking into the main chamber. Each ends the same too, walking through the particle field and into the aperture elevator again. Although, looking closely, the walls of the elevator seem like they haven't been cleaned in a while. There are spots on the walls and stains on the floor. The whole place is eerily quiet except for the test chambers themselves. The tests are lit by blinding observation rooms, but it's apparent that throughout the entire experiment, only these wall-mounted cameras observe your performance. Where is everyone? Portal's simple environment is great because its gameplay functionality doesn't get in the way of its story functionality, and its story functionality doesn't get in the way of its gameplay functionality. A lot of games lean too far in the direction of creating an environment for their stories, which can lead to the actual gameplay becoming unclear or frustrating. Some games even lean in the other direction, using environments that are great for gameplay, but have no theme or feelings associated with them, which causes the game to feel pointless or repetitive. Portal keeps its environments extremely friendly to gameplay, while using subtle, non-disturbing elements to create a world that matters. We get access to the portal gun in Test Chamber 2, but we have to wait in this room while some dialogue plays, which may seem irritating, but the loud sounds coming from behind the glass show the portal gun majestically sitting on a rotating pedestal. This gives the player a chance to observe how it works before having it in their hands. When the door does open, we can finally pick up the portal gun. You have to shoot a portal to proceed, as the auto portal is removed when the portal gun is picked up. This whole room gives you a bit of a small play area to experiment. The next chamber defines some simple principles. You need to place and go through a blue portal, then replace the blue portal and go through the orange one instead. This allows the player to get used to the two methods of portal use with the single portal gun. One is to place a portal and go through it to the stationary portal, and the other is to place a portal at a desired location and go through the stationary portal to get to the desired location. When the player gets the dual portal device later on, the player will already be used to using either portal for either goal, which will be important in some chambers. That's ominous. We also get our first look inside the facility, albeit a small one. It's just a hint, something to keep you interested in the world and tell you that this isn't what it seems. Behind the white panels is a dirty and rusty interior strewn with cables. We'll get more of this later, but for now, let's move on to Chamber 4, where cubes are reintroduced now that we can use the portal gun. Once again, the button is placed such that it is the first object to interact with. This time, a pane of glass separates the player from the door so that you can't just portal across. You have to come down to this pit and create a portal so that you can then... Oh. Well, this game's main feature is illegal physics. At the end of this chamber, we encounter these dark metal panels. Most players will just walk past this, but sneaky players who want to grab the cube will have been foiled, though they will get the upper hand on how materials affect where portals can be placed. The next test chamber is a proper puzzle. The only new concept here is the two buttons. Beyond that, we're just applying the same principles we learned so far as a sort of checkpoint. The next chamber introduces the energy pellet. It's a pretty simple concept, like golf, but slightly more deadly. I'm personally not a huge fan of the energy pellet because it's slow and kind of hard to see and it kills you instantly. Hey, like, ah! However, we see the metal panels once again and get another chance to experiment with them, though they still don't make a huge impact on how the chamber plays. The next chamber is just as simple, though it introduces another object, the moving flat. Now use the aperture size on stationary scaffold to reach the chamber lock. My bad, I meant the Aperture Science Unstationary Scaffold. What's next, the Aperture Science Organic Dissolvent Acid? No, this is just called Toxic Goo. I'm fairly sure the Toxic Goo is never really explained. Where did it come from? Why does it kill you instantly? I just finished talking about the intentional environment design, and of course Valve has to ruin it. The next chamber makes up for it, though. 
the Emancipation Grill makes its first appearance inside a puzzle. You need to get a cube up here and then shoot a portal through the gap to win. Remember this test chamber. It'll be important later. You better be taking notes. Chamber 10 has this weird audio stutter. Which, ironically, gives us all the information we need. This chamber is really fun. Launching through portals will never get old. It isn't until chamber 11 out of 19 that we actually reach the dual portal gun. Like when we first encountered the portal gun, we can view it from above before we portal to a landing below. I was surprised to see while reviewing this footage that this is also the first time a button pedestal shows up. These chambers sure are getting complex. Here, the player must portal up to this room indicated by the timed door. The door is important because it conveys that the action required shouldn't take that much time. If it were just an open hallway, it might be somewhat more confusing, and players might try to jump up there somehow. After the energy pellet reaches the receptacle, the moving platform becomes available, and we take a slow ride to the dual portal gun as the music changes. The music in Portal isn't exactly a standout. The music is mostly ambient to contribute to the unnerving loneliness of the game. But this one track is especially noticeable and kind of makes you feel like you can do anything. This is now more valuable than the organs and combined incomes of everyone in. Subject phone call, here. I said makes you feel like it. Now that we've been introduced to most of the major mechanics and have the dual portal gun, the puzzles begin to ramp up along with the story. Listen to this dialogue. This next test could take a very, very long time. If you become lightheaded from thirst, feel free to pass out. An intubation associate will be dispatched to revive you with peptic salve and adrenaline. Good to know the Enrichment Center has my back. The next couple chambers just combine everything into multi-step puzzles. Chamber 15 requires the player to learn the double portal fling. I don't really like this trick. Basically, you have to launch yourself through a portal, and then place another portal and fly through it again. This chained momentum lets you fly way further, but this trick is hard to learn for the first time, and it's kind of finicky to pull off correctly. We get another shakeup in chamber 16. Due to mandatory scheduled maintenance, the appropriate chamber for this testing sequence is currently unavailable. It has been replaced with a live fire course designed for military androids. The Enrichment Center apologizes for the inconvenience and wishes you the best of luck. Well, it's good to hear they're sorry, isn't it? I sure am glad they have my back. The turrets in Portal are interesting because they're virtually the only active hostile enemies, and they're not really very good ones either. They don't move, and they can't even rotate very well. Aperture obviously cut some corners with these things. I came up with my own design for a turret that costs half as much while having greater functionality. Although, why are these things sentient? These turrets are more like sentient tripods with bullet slingshots than actually effective turrets. It takes at least 20 bullets to even hurt anything. Hello. Okay, I guess they're not completely useless. The benefit to these inefficient machines is that they are very easy to exploit. I mean, as a turret it may be awful, but it is an awesome gameplay mechanic. These things take a second or so to spot you, which gives you just a bit of time to look at your surroundings or shoot a portal, usually behind a turret. These things have a pretty limited pivot range, which means attacking from behind is the primary way of taking them out. But you didn't need me to tell you that. This is the first room. Yeah, you can just knock these things over and they give up. These turrets aren't really supposed to be enemies in the traditional sense. They just change the way the chamber is approached. It forces the player to act quickly and allows more creative solutions. You don't have to personally portal behind the turret and knock it over. In fact, the game encourages other solutions. Let the turret fall through a portal. Let a cube fall on a turret. Or let a turret fall on a turret. The method to solving this kind of puzzle is more open-ended and allows for multiple solutions. It also allows for dumb ways to die. This chamber also lets us get into the inner workings of the facility. It's a pretty considerable contrast with the white, brightly lit test chambers. Someone's been living here too. For some time, at least. If you weren't sure something was up before, this has got to be a sign that this isn't what it looks like. 
Nah, that's probably just a rodent problem. The next test chamber is the infamous companion cube chamber. This chamber is mostly about using the energy pellets, but at the end, we're forced to throw the companion cube down this incinerator. The faithful companion cube that assists in getting through this chamber helps in ways that only a faithful companion can. Pressing a button, jumping upstairs, taking the full force of a deadly energy pellet. Actually, this thing could probably take the flames. The last few chambers just combine concepts and ramp up the difficulty. In chamber 18, for example, there's this little jump over a gap to a wall portal. Remember this. The last test chamber wraps things up with a moving platform in a narrow hallway. It has to be activated with these angled panels that trip everyone up when they try to do this. Finally, we reach the end. All aperture technologies remain safely operational up to 4,000 degrees Kelvin. No, how could this have happened? Remember that thing we did one time? Wow, from here, we are now in the escape sequence. No more test chambers. We now must navigate the inner facility that, conveniently, has nearly every wall made of portal-friendly surface. The escape sequence is a lot of fun because, now that we've played and enjoyed the puzzle chambers, navigating through the facility is mostly the same, but it makes the player feel like they're figuring out something that wasn't designed to be figured out. You're not just solving carefully crafted puzzle rooms. You're now on the inside, and no one is there to observe you. It's an excellent way to make the gameplay seem drastically different while simply changing the environment. For example, at one point, the player goes through a cube delivery pipe to fall back into this test chamber. Remember this? Should be in your notes. This chamber is easily bypassed with the dual portal gun, and it just feels so good to break this. Really quickly, has anyone else noticed this vacuum cube shoot thing? I didn't actually see this on my first playthrough, and... Only just now I've noticed it because it's kind of hidden away behind this fence, and it looks really odd because the air is visibly moving, but doesn't make sound, and the cube moves oddly from the upper two chutes, and the funnel thing is almost plastic-looking plain gray, while the pipe uses glass and rusted beams, and this whole thing doesn't really need to be this complex because you can just connect the upper thing to the pipe without any of this funnel air thing. This thing is just really weird. I don't understand why it's here, and it's clearly not just like a copy-paste of some other asset. I'll move on. What is this thing? I guess this isn't so out of place when there's literally an entire room of cylinders that move back and forth for seemingly no reason at all. Some of these rooms were clearly not designed with a specific purpose in mind, but it gets better as we go on. Before that, though, we encounter our first ambush. We have to do some quick thinking to bypass these turrets, then move forward a bit to get to the office area. This area looks at least a bit more presentable, even if I don't particularly like the decision Aperture made to install lights in the floor? In an office area? I need to see where my feet are going, not the bare ceiling. Maybe they want to reduce the rampant problem of people leaving chairs out in the hallway. The next room has a big red button. This is beautiful game design. The player triggers the rocket launcher to start right behind the glass. The launcher locks on and shoots the glass, leaving the player unharmed, but now under immediate pressure to act. This is so effective because it teaches how the rocket launcher locks onto the player, how it destroys a glass on impact, and then puts the player in a position to immediately act on this new knowledge. Naturally, there's a pane of glass on the other side of the room, and using our newfound knowledge, we bravely wait for the rocket launcher to lock on, then move out of the way for the glass. Perfect. In less than 10 seconds, the player now understands how to exploit the rocket launcher. The next room builds on this, where we must break some more glass to get through. Now, we're ready for the next area. What is the next area? The second ambush. It's about time. This is just more turret playground. After all the turrets are disabled, we review the double of portal flings, and move on through this giant mysterious room to another office area. Oh look, another giant mysterious room with a giant mysterious room inside. You know what that means? That's right, it's time to face GLaDOS. At almost no point does GLaDOS' name ever show up before this point. In fact, GLaDOS never says it at all. The only indication of GLaDOS' name are on this primitive presentation, and on the covers of these rotating... things. What are these? What is any of this? 
I may not be a, a supercomputer expert, but I'm fairly sure they aren't typically hung from the ceiling and given moving joints for no reason. This is kind of a huge machine. GLaDOS's design is rather... atypical, but is indeed purposeful. GLaDOS's design certainly seems alien, but it's actually vaguely humanoid. Obviously, this is the head, but you can also make out the shoulder, which is part of an arm, which is attached to the body that is apparently hanging in this unnatural curve. The thing about this humanoid shape is that it's so far removed from humanoid, it's not really easy to see that on the first glance, but it is vaguely humanoid enough to make GLaDOS feel alive, which is the intended effect. The GLaDOS boss fight is kind of like using a PS5 controller for spreadsheets. It doesn't make a lot of sense. What are these monitors for? They're absurdly large, and they all just display the same image. Well, they all simultaneously show a rapidly changing set of images, many of which are cake. Are these supposed to represent Gladys' thoughts? They don't really change until they turn into countdown timers. By the way, shout out to the engineer who added exact saturation timers that override the monitors in case this room were to be filled with neurotoxin. Upon first entering this room, GLaDOS attempts to greet the player with surprise that we never end up receiving because this morality core just happens to fall out of GLaDOS at this exact moment. It doesn't really do anything. GLaDOS doesn't change at all and just instead keep talking about it for some reason but doesn't actually know what it is or what it does. It isn't until we figure out how to incinerate it that GLaDOS actually freaks out. If these things work wirelessly, why are they plugged into the body in the first place? What I do find interesting about this boss fight is the drastic change to GLaDOS's voice once the morality core is destroyed. The dumbest thing that- Whoa, 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 whoa. Good news. I figured out what that thing you just incinerated did. It shatters everything before it, and this change that only happens during this last sequence is really unnerving and masterfully sets the tone for this new, awakened GLaDOS. It also conveniently turns on this turret. Shout out to the engineer who not only installed a collapsible turret here, but made it activate upon the destruction of the morality core if the neurotoxin emitters were to be activated afterward. Anyway, nonsense aside, we already know how to exploit these turrets to find even more nonsense! GLaDOS doesn't really react to the turret's landing. I can live with that, but what I can't live with is this weird tractor beam thing. What is this? This never appears before or after this fight. The cores are just carried to arbitrary locations by this greenish beam that moves them once and then doesn't move them at all and then automatically disappears when the core is moved. They come from GLaDOS, but Again, they're basically non-existent in the dialogue or otherwise. To be fair, creating a boss fight where the main gameplay mechanic, the portal gun, doesn't directly interact with other objects is not an easy task, especially when most of the other gameplay mechanics are designed to work in specific conditions. This isn't a bad boss fight, but it's clear the developers had to compromise because of the limiting mechanics. The portal gun is an auxiliary device in any environment that isn't puzzle solving. This may be the climax of the plot, but the boss fight isn't the peak of port, and that's okay. Something I do like about this boss fight is the continuous dialogue. With each core you destroy, GLaDOS has a different set of dialogue. You simply cannot get all the dialogue in one session. Because GLaDOS is a robot and isn't even actively fighting in any way, the dialogue just keeps going and going, which makes this rather slow-paced fight still incredibly entertaining. After incinerating the blue core, GLaDOS's dialogue noticeably shifts to childish and hollow insults. That's a nice touch. Once GLaDOS is defeated, we get this awesome defeat sequence where instead of recording new audio, they just massively speed up and slow down the existing voice clips. No points deducted though, because that's totally something I would do too. I'm still not exactly sure why GLaDOS just starts falling apart and everything goes up, but again, I'm not a scientist, so perhaps this is normal behavior. And... that's it. This game isn't incredibly long. 19 chambers, the escape sequence, and the boss fight. That's it. I wouldn't say it's disappointingly short though, not at all. I think it nails the length, actually. Right at about chamber 19 is where it starts to get old, which is why it's the perfect place for the escape sequence. And, of course, as the escape sequence begins to drag on, GLaDOS's chamber is right around the corner. This game is like a perfectly portioned meal. Not too little, not too much.
If you're still hungry for more though, Portal also has a lot of challenges and achievements that change up the existing content. Overall, Portal is kind of a surprise hit. This was definitely more of an experimental game. A lot of games have puzzle elements, but a first-person, semi-story-based puzzle game? Sure, plenty of those exist now, but back in 2007, those were untested waters. Well, at least the last game to try this concept didn't do very well. Everything was against this game. Portal is an impressive game because of how surprisingly good it is. This game also has an RTX remaster. Ray tracing is the future, after all. Uh. Oh. Thank you.